Hey everyone, welcome back to our daily devotions in Israel, and uh, we find ourselves on a really incredible day. You're going to have to hold with me uh, for some time today because there's just so much that happens on Thursday. Uh, Jesus wakes up, they're back in Bethany, um, and as they're traveling from Bethany uh, to Jerusalem once again, it's a really important day. Um, it is the eve of the Passover, um, which is actually in the Jewish calendar, if you uh, want to sound educated <laughs> within your uh, uh, Jewish friends, uh, is this Nisan 14, um, the first day of the uh, Feast of the Unleavened Bread. Now, that's supposed to be the 15th day, uh, but at sundown uh, last night, actually, um, that was the four N Nisan 14. This is Nisan 15, um, so this is the Passover. So sundown last night on Wednesday night, April 8th, um, it was the start. Of Passover, which is a one-day event um, where they uh, being able to sacrifice the lamb, um, eat the the dinner that was in Exodus um, in haste, right, for the waiting for their deliverance and the freedom that God was going to give them by passing over them uh, with the angel of death. Uh, because of what? You know it well. The blood of the lamb was spread over their door frames uh, so that it would save them. And that is what Jesus is doing with his disciples on this Thursday, Monday Thursday. Um, it's a Holy Thursday, as people call it as well, as because it was the last uh, time for the Last Supper. Uh, but I want to walk with you real quickly. Uh, we can uh, do this once again. I know these slides are getting very similar, right? Um, but uh, uh, we will spotlight it again. Here is Jesus in Bethany. Now, if you open up to Mark chapter 14, uh, with me real quick. Mark chapter 14, that's where we're going to be in today. It kind of spans the time of what happened on Thursday in Holy Week. Um, this is uh, sometimes a little bit contrast and different uh, because Mark chapter 14, the beginning of it is that Jesus is anointed in Bethany. Now in John, uh, John's gospel, that happens before the triumphal entry. Um, either way, Either way, the same people are involved. It's not necessarily the same timing in the Gospels, uh, but the same purpose um, is brought forth in Mark chapter 14. So I'm just going to, I'm not going to read with you through, I'm just going to kind of walk you through the reality of what was happening uh, during these times. And so in Bethany, uh, that's where Lazarus was raised from the dead. Uh, that's where Mary and Martha lived with their brother, right? And so Jesus went to their house. He's reclining at their table and Mary breaks out this alabaster jar of perfume. Now, it was proper, it was proper when people were dying in that time to be able to, in a very Jewish ritual way, as they died, um, they would perfume the body, they would uh, anoint the body uh, to be able to prepare it for burial. Um, and uh, this was most likely a lot of times after their death, quickly before they were buried, as it's uh, Jewish custom, quickly in that kind of way. But Jesus knew, and frankly, Mary, um, as purposed by God, um, broke open his alabaster jar, perfumed him, anointed him before his burial because they knew that his death, or frankly, God knew that his death would be in haste and there wouldn't be an opportunity for them to anoint the body for burial. That's why Jesus didn't stop her. That's why Jesus said, yeah, I know it's an expensive thing. You're always going to have the poor, but you're not always going to have me in predicting his death and that being very quickly. So in Mark's gospel, it's pretty uh, done in haste on that kind of, it seems like the morning of Thursday. Um, and then he sends out um, his disciples. He sends out his disciples to go take the path once again, Bethany to Jerusalem, go into Jerusalem. Um, and I just want to read this with you uh, real quickly, starting at verse uh, 12. It says this, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is that Nisan 15, however, Nisan 14 is that preparation day. And that's a lot of times included into the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so Passover and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread is for a week. It's eight days. It's going to be, it started last night on April 8th. It's going to end on April 16th. Um, but this week-long festival that they're going to fast from leaven, uh, that they're going to reflect upon the freedom that they have that God did in Exodus um, to his people of Israel. It says in verse 12, on the first day of the unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, that's what they would do on the eve of the unleavened bread. So in the Passover, they would sacrifice this Passover lamb. Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Now here's the custom. Um, the people that were coming into Jerusalem, Jerusalem was at that time probably about 50,000 people. Um, that's how many people lived there. However, we're talking a couple hundred thousand people that were in Jerusalem, especially for the Passover feast. If you did not live there and you had an extra room, you would give pilgrims 
a time to be able to have a place that they could celebrate the Passover. And so where would you want us to go pre prepare the Passover? There's going to be rooms available. And so who do you want us to go to? So he, he sent two of his disciples, Peter and John, as well known, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Now, a man carrying a jar of water, how, 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 could, this, how could this be? How could he foretell that? Well, men didn't carry jars of water. Those were usually women. And so did Jesus meet this man that was doing uh, his own work in this kind of way, a jar of water? It seems so. So you're going to see, see a man. I probably already prepared that beforehand because you got to remember. You got to remember. A lot of times uh, we do this hocus pocus like Jesus knew all these things. He did. He is God. But they were also in Jerusalem uh, uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Why were they in Jerusalem? Not just because he can overturn the tables, not just because he could focus people on faith, but they did it in a Jewish custom of being able to purify themselves before the feast. That's why people came there so early, right? Six days before in John's gospel, we get to see that he was anointed, um, uh, uh, that, she, that Mary anointed him with that uh, perfume. But the reality is six days before, he was coming there early because there was the ritual of purifying themselves before the feast. Jesus did that in an incredible way. He purified the temple by his teaching of truth, by his uh, speaking to it uh, with overturning the tables, making it a den of robbers rather than a place of prayer. He's purifying this place to get ready for the feast of the Passover because the Lamb of God was coming and being able to sacrifice himself to free people from their sin, to free people from the bondage of sin. So he sent him in. There's going to be a guy carrying a jar. It says in verse 14, say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where's my guest room? Where is my guest room? Probably because he prepared that before. Where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples left, in, uh, left and went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. So let's journey with them. They went into Jerusalem. And they took from the Mount of Olives, coming into the East Gate, most likely going by the temple courts. I wonder if there's anybody there. But being able to go throughout the city, as it's the old city here, um, and they saw a man carrying a jar of water, and it went into a house right here, right in the city of David. This was kind of where we get to see the city of David today. But kind of the city of David as it was kind of expansive in this kind of way in the Essene quarter. Now, Essenes are... There's Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes, a different sect of Judaism at that time. What they believed, they were pretty strict, they were pretty conservative people. But in this place, in this quarter, there was a house that this man went into that owner, and they were going to prepare the place in the upper room. Now, this is the really neat thing. I'm just going to continue to tell you. This, this day that we visited Jerusalem was off awe-inspiring it really was because we really did take the walk we went from the mount of olives we went through garden of semi we went to the upper room um and being able to say here as you see here it's a, it's a journey not too far maybe take as you're walking maybe 15 minutes um because it's pretty close stuff and so you're you're walking mount of olives coming in and here's this upper room it is on what we call now mount zion now that's pretty sweet mount zion and so the reality to that is it's also in this upper room. It's also the place um, where David um, was buried, they would say. There is actually his tomb, but it's not really his remains in there. There's tomb underneath this upper room. It's a really special site um, where you're going up into this room. And as you go, this is, this is where we are today. This is the contemporary um, uh, Jerusalem. This is what Jerusalem looks like today. And so as you walk in to the Temple Mound, you don't just walk in. Uh, but as we went uh, forward, here's the Jewish quarter, the Wailing Wall, as we talked about the other days. Uh, but the Zion Gate, right, the, the, the Armenian quarter, uh, this is where we get to see um, uh, Mount Zion. And just outside these walls, there is a place called <clears throat> the Senecal, which is uh, in Latin uh, for the upper room. And so uh, this is the place where Jesus had most traditionally thinking. It's not, we don't know exactly, uh, but uh, this is the traditional spot where Jesus celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples. And so as we come back here, I'm gonna zoom in, as you can see here, this upper room, right? I want you to pay attention to something really quickly. I'm gonna come back to it. Here's the upper room of Mount Zion. Do you see what's right next to it? This is the high priest Caiaphas's house. 
Now, you might not know what that is right now. Maybe you do because you've read through the scriptures before. Um, but we're going to get back to that in just a second because he comes to the upper room to celebrate the Last Supper with his disciples. And then as we get to see that, I know you know what happens there. Um, he, he goes forth and has that. Uh, he stoops down, washes their feet. Um, oops, excuse me. Um, washes their feet. Um, and then as he washes their feet, um, he celebrates the Passover with them. He also predicts his betrayal um, and walks forward and speaks to them about his death. And so we have that in Mark chapter 14. We read a little bit of that. It says, when the evening came, Jesus arrived with the 12. While they were reclining at the table, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. And so I'm going to stop the share real quickly because I want to travel with you to an incredible place. And it's called the upper room. And that is right here. We are now in the upper room in the cynical, as cynical um, in the Latin upper room, uh, where Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples. It's this little room archway, and this is now actually 12th century uh, kind of architecture and stuff like that because it goes down and up, but this is the kind of place it would look like an upper room just like this. Not very big, um, but uh, uh, the really neat thing about this upper room is a very consistent way as you see the upper room uh, for eating with his disciples. The disciples knew this place, so they actually came back to this upper room. Was this the upper room that they were locked in for fear of the Jews? Could very well be. This is the upper room uh, where Pentecost rushes in. There's a lot of things that happen right in this upper room. And so as you get to see here, um, it's, a, it's a space here. I got actually a, a mock picture here. Uh, I'll show you the one uh, pretty, uh, I won't show you the one pretty soon that I ca captured uh, because it's just filled with people and it's kind of a stretched view. Uh, but I want, I want you to see this right here. Um, this is a, uh, a tree stump. Um, and it is actually an olive tree stump. Uh, it was put there later on, later on, but it was signifying that there's a lot of things happening in this space right here. Um, right off top of this upper room, nowadays, there's a Muslim minaret, um, and it was in the uh, 12th and 13th centuries, we get to see, um, or actually right before that, uh, that this was kind of a Muslim uh, place. And so uh, it exchanged hands within the Crusades and really became a Christian place of worship. But also right underneath it, as I said, right underneath this in the basement, uh, David's tomb is where actually people are still praying today uh, to be able to uh, bring about the Messiah. And so you see this intersection between Muslim, Ju uh, Christian, and Judaism, as you get to see throughout the, the city of Jerusalem, but especially in this place. And so Pope John the Paul II uh, placed this in this room, um, and he wanted, it's called a uh, stump of peace. And so he wanted peace between the Muslims and the Christians and Ju uh, Judaism, um, that kind of way as well. But I'm going to get to this as well. There's a column right here, um, and I'm just on the tip of my finger, there's something really special here um, that was uh, in the architecture in the 12th century. I'm going to show you that real quickly. Um, it is, uh, as we go forward in here, here's that stump. But the really neat thing about the stump is it's not just an olive tree. But as you can see, uh, there is, as I kind of hover my um, arrow over it, here is some grapes, the vine, as you can see there, and also the grain. What happened in this upper room? Jesus took bread and he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body. He took the cup, right? The second cup of the Passover. Um, and this is my blood of the covenant, of the covenant uh, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. So there's a semblance there in the room as we get to see there in a way. But here is that pillar. Um, the pillar is quite unique. Um, and this is really neat to be able to say uh, as people kind of look into this upper room. It's a, it's a fascinating place. But as you see here, if you ever hear about the pelicans um, within the upper room, here they are. Here's some pelicans. Here's a baby pelican and here's a baby pelican. Maybe I can get my annotate because um, it's just a little easier to spot if that makes sense. Here's the baby pelican with his neck and his thing. Here's the baby pelican with his neck and his thing. And here's the mom pelican. And what she would do, what pelicans would do that they believed kind of a, kind of a tall tale, uh, but it's just the reality of what they would do to bring their babies back or strengthen them from death to life is that they would actually uh, pluck their own chest, like put their beak into their own breasts um, to be able to make the flow of blood for their babies, for their flow of blood to their children, so that their blood would be a sustenance, their blood would be life-giving, sacrificing their own blood to be able to have the life sustenance of the other. 
sound familiar? Yeah, that's why this pillar in this 12th century architecture puts it in this upper room, because this is what exactly Jesus is saying, that my own blood is going to spill out over for you, for you disciples, to be able to have life and life everlasting. Um, that's what happened in this upper room as we get to have uh, uh, understanding. So then, so then they journey. They go, as it says in verse 26 of Mark chapter 14, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And here it is, the Mount of Olives. Uh, we get to see here uh, that within the Mount of Olives, uh, we have, oh, sorry, I lost my pointer. We have the Mount, such a peaceful place, right at the bottom of the Mount of Olives, but here is the Garden of Gethsemane. As they made their way to the Mount of Olives, all of a sudden, they came into this garden where Jesus wanted to go pray. But he, while they were uh, going there, you can see in Mark chapter 14, he predicted Peter's denial. Um, and as he predicted Peter's denial, then they come to this place called Gethsemane, which is Hebrew for oil press. So there's olive trees uh, all over in this kind of oil presses within this uh, uh, garden of Gethsemane. If you can see it okay on my screen, it's right at the base of the city. It, you come all the way down uh, from the Mount of Olives, and you're sitting down in the, in the bottom level, in the bottom hill. Before you go down into the Kidron Valley, here is this garden of Gethsemane. But you see, as you look above here, this is the east gate. This is the east gate of the city. And so as you have that east gate, you're looking from Garden of Gethsemane, and it's not too far. It's just across the way. And as the Garden of Gethsemane comes forward, um, this is something that absolutely was amazing to me. He went from the upper room. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane. You want to journey with me? Um, let's do that. Garden of Gethsemane. And then as he was uh, praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, this was probably one of the biggest highlights for me uh, to sit and be in this place. Because just to the south of this garden, there's a church now, but just to the south of this place um, was this big rock, this, this rock, this bedrock uh, that spanned throughout um, uh, the church. And this is what it looked like. Now, you see on the sides even, it goes even farther out to the sides. Um, it goes out there, um, it goes off to the side, this huge laid bedrock at the bottom of the Mount of Olives. Um, and this is the place. This is why it's like kind of a uh, section off the traditional place where Jesus went, where he knelt on the rock and prayed. He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he did that as he came back and forth to his disciples three times. They fell asleep. Uh, you can see that uh, within Mark chapter 14. Uh, Stay here and keep watch, as he said, for it is time. And as he goes away, he speaks, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but not, not what I will, but what you will. Mark chapter 14, verse 36. Jesus praying, uh, just as we, as we understand it from Luke's gospel, praying so fervently that uh, drops of blood were coming from his body and onto this rock, it seems so. I had the privilege, I really did. It was pretty empty as we walked in. Um, and as I walked into this place, this is the front, you can see the altar uh, just right above me here. Um, and right in front of it is this rock. Uh, but then there's nice little places over here, like little benches, stuff like that. You see these like little uh, sectioned off things? <laughs> uh, I went up to this bench and, and, I, and I just got into this, just was drawn into this, yeah, in time of intense prayer. Uh, not sweating drops of blood, uh, but being able to, this entire sense of prayer that, oh my gosh, we're in the spot where Jesus just humbly puts before him, not my will, but your will's father, right? Take this cup from me, the cup of your wrath, the cup of the, the bearing of everyone's sin, but not my will, yours will. If this is what you have determined, then I will complete this mission. And frankly, and it just drew me into this time of prayer. I was such in a time of prayer right here that all of a sudden um, somebody comes in, uh, comes in and they were actually starting worship. And I was just sitting there. I was roped in to the altar area um, and I had to like climb over the rope uh, because they were coming into this worship area. They didn't want to disturb. I appreciate that. Thank you for anybody that they're watching this. <laughs> but uh, it was a time of prayer and a time of just understanding uh, that, wow, what Jesus was walking forward in, just bending upon, kneeling upon this rock and knowing what is to come into his future. And what was going to come into his future? It was a reality to walk back to out when he comes out into the garden 
And as he walks out into the garden, let me share that real quickly with you. Excuse me. He comes out into the garden. And there, in this garden of Gethsemane, Judas comes with a horde of people from the city to arrest Jesus in this kind of way. As they arrested Jesus, he kisses him, he betrays him, and frankly, the soldiers take him off. Now, in John's gospel, um, the first place he's taken is to Annas. Annas was, used to be the high priest, um, and he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. So as they bring him into Annas's place, we don't really know where Annas's place was, um, but then they ship him off, Mark chapter 14, verse 53, um, they took Jesus to the high priest. So here he was. Um, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Oops. Garden of Gethsemane. Here he is over here. Here's the garden, this green little spot up here. They take him through into the city. They take him down through the city, back to almost exactly where they were in the upper room, and they take him over to the high priest Caiaphas's house. Now, they wouldn't be holding stuff in the temple because you got to remember, this is evening. They've already had the Passover meal. They've already sung hymns. They've already walked over to the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, Jesus had a time of prayer. The disciples were falling asleep because it was such a full day. Um, they couldn't keep awake how late it was, uh, people being able to speak towards 11, 12 o'clock, you know, midnight uh, kind of time frame. They arrest him in the, in, in the deepness of the night. Uh, they want to be sly because of the crowds. Uh, they would be astonished that they would be doing this kind of stuff, so they're sly with it. They arrest him in the deep hours of the night, um, and they take him to high priest Caiaphas's house. Don't take him to the temple. It's all shut down. The high priest Caiaphas' house, they do this kind of, they call the whole Sanhedrin. We're talking about, this is no small thing, 71 people, they wake up probably, because you got to remember, this is the time of Passover. This is the time of slaughtering all the, the lambs. There, there's such a hubbub going on in Jerusalem. They're talking about, uh, some people talk about upwards to a million animals sacrificed in this place. You can see that the priests and, and the teachers of the law, the people that are put in that position, have had incredible days of just continuing slaughter after slaughter after slaughter. And they call them together, and they do come together at Caiaphas's house right here. Jesus brought before the Sanhedrin, questioned by Caiaphas. And as he's questioned him, you go down to verse uh, 61. But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? Right? They wouldn't even say God. They wouldn't even say Yahweh. They would say the blessed one because they revered their name so much. And Jesus said, what? What? He said, I am, which is Yahweh. Ugh. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. I am the Messiah. I am the, the Son of Yahweh. I am the Son of God. And at this high priest tore his clothes, not in grief, but in also, yes, in grief, uh, grieving that somebody would say such a thing. That is such blasphemy. You heard him. And what do you say? You have heard blasphemy. What do you think? That was punishable by death, by stoning. But they couldn't carry that out, especially during the Passover. Um, they couldn't carry that out, uh, mainly because of the Roman law, that they couldn't really bring a death sentence um, on Jesus. And so high priest Caiaphas's house, this is something really special uh, that you can walk forward. You can still have that house today. Um, and I want to walk you through um, this place. So here we have, here is the Dome of the Rock, as you see there. Here is the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, the Mount of Olives off to the right side here. So on top uh, right of the thing. They walk him down, you know, through the city. But here is something that just made your hair stand up on your arms. Because as they walked through here, I am actually standing on kind of a balcony area of Caiaphas's house and looking out. As you walk down this place, you walk, he, they walked him up these stairs. Now, I am not over-exaggerating when I said the hair comes off of your arms because they walked Jesus up these stairs. These are Roman stairs that were put in Jerusalem 2000 years ago. So when I say he walked up these stairs, these are the stairs that Jesus walked up. His feet hit this stone. Oh man, it just, I'll get a different angle. Here's the stairs coming up into the place, into the courtyard of Caiaphas's house. Um, and that's significant too in just a little bit. 
So we walked up these stairs, fascinating. I was just taken away. My breath was taken away, uh, being able to say, there was Jesus. Jesus, if you can put him in your head, walking up these stairs, chained and kind of uh, dragged along uh, by these soldiers up these stairs into the courtyard of Caiaphas's house, into Caiaphas's house to stand trial. And as he stand, stood trial, they, they questioned him. Then they tore his clothes. They began to spit on him. They began to uh, hit him and prophesy. And while that was happening inside the house, what was happening in the courtyard? That's verse 66. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servants girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also are a Nazarene. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. He denied Jesus in the courtyard of Caiaphas's house, right up these stairs in the courtyard while he was warming himself three times before the rooster crowed. Now, one of the things that we, when we were out on the balcony of Caiaphas's house, there was roosters all over the place. It was pretty surreal. Um, and they were, and I was like, oh my goodness, getting you into that spot. I don't know if they do that on purpose, but it's just these houses below that actually have chickens uh, running kind of around and sporadic, uh, but they are making those sounds, those rooster sounds. Um, and it was just kind of bone chilling. So here we are, uh, Jesus walking forth. Now they have excavated uh, Caiaphas's house and this is pretty incredible as well. They've uh, excavated and they saw these underground caves, um, which they call prisons underneath Caiaphas's house. And so Jesus was brought in, questioned by Caiaphas. Um, and as you get to see here, as they had excavated, they have these little prisons, these little pits, as they call them. Um, they call it the sacred pits. Um, there was crosses um, that were etched into these pits from people from down below um, and being able to see uh, who was lowered into these pits just so we are aware. Um, don't know for certain, but most likely, with it being the middle of the night, the Sanhedrin called, it seemed like a pretty uh, quick understanding. Jesus was lowered down as they would kind of put ropes around their chest, lowered down through these little holes. As you can see the hole, um, I'm now in the pit, lowered down in here to keep prisoners um, until their time of trial. So, while Jesus was being beaten and uh, called names and uh, all this kind of stuff, Peter's disowning him out in the courtyard of Caiaphas' house. And then Jesus is lowered down into the pit. And as he's lowered down into the pit, that's where we end Maundy Thursday. Because it picks up in Mark chapter 15, very early in the morning, they take him to Pilate. And we'll get there tomorrow on Good Friday. But here is where we reside. And so that's where I'd actually like to reside with you. Um, and there's something that we did in this pit um, that really beckons us uh, to be able to do that together. Imagine yourself in this pit. And then I want to read to you to close off our devotion today um, what is well known, um, frankly, a suffering servant psalm. Um, and the suffering servant in Isaiah is obviously Jesus. And he speaks that way of the suffering servant. Um, and uh, Psalm 88, let's close it off with the word of God um, and hear these words. These aren't Jesus's words, but these are the psalmist's words that you can imagine Jesus. That's what we did. We, we read Psalm 88 with a group together down in this pit, and it was bone chill. It was hair off your uh, arms and stuff like that, raising. Um, and here is Psalm 88, if you want to open that up with me. Um, it is this way. O oh Lord, the God who saves me, day and night I cry out before you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of trouble. My life draws near the grave. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like a man without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave. When you remember whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily upon me and have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, O Lord, every day. I spread my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do those who are dead rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness and destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, O Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, O oh Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth, I have been afflicted and close to death. I have suffered your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long, they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken my companions and loved ones from me. 
The darkness is my closest friend. When you're sitting in this pit in Caiaphas's house, it put me into this place, and maybe you can be in that place as well, on Monday, Thursday, that in that garden he was arrested, but all of his disciples fled. Just Peter and John kind of followed him into Caiaphas's house, but yet they didn't say anything. Actually, Peter did say something. He disowned him. His closest friends are deserting him. Darkness is his closest friend as he sits in this pit, as he awaiting trial and being able to see what his allotment is. He knows it full well. That's why he said, take this cup from me, but your will be done, not mine. And God's will was to lower him into this pit, was bring him to Caiaphas's house, bring about the charge of blasphemy, and bring him to Pilate on Good Friday to see what they would do in the wee hours of six o'clock to nine o'clock in the morning. And then all of a sudden, nine o'clock, he's on Golgotha. We'll get there tomorrow. Thanks for joining me. I know it's a little bit lengthier, but an incredible walk on Monday, Thursday, to be able to know from Bethany to the upper room, to the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, to Caiaphas's house, down into a pit. Darkness is Jesus's closest friend as he awaits his trial. Have a blessed day knowing that Jesus took this walk, took all these journeys, is sitting in the pit, and the darkness is his closest friend because he wanted to do it for you and for me so that we could have salvation by the blood of the Lamb, the new covenant that is the blood of Jesus shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Go in peace knowing that Jesus did this for you. Have a blessed day.